So I guess he already kind of introduced me. I'm Adam Nichols. I'm not the preaching pastor here at First Baptist Church. As he said earlier, Josh is away at a conference this week, and he asked me to speak to you. I don't know what's going on, if I spit the last time I talked or what, but nobody sits anywhere in front here. So I don't know what's going on with that, but I'm taking note that you, you guys won't sit close. Um, so I'm going to be kind of your tour guide this week as we continue on Paul's journey as he's gone into Ephesus. And we're looking at Acts 19, 11 through 41 this week. As Josh had alluded to last week, Ephesus is a prominent port city in the region. The city was home of the great temple of Artemis. And I have a picture of it here. I have a picture of the statue of Artemis and uh, the temple. And I just want you to kind of think of, of what it must have been like back in the time that Paul walked these streets. Um, if you were in Ephesus, you would certainly know about this temple. It was a massive temple that was double the dimensions of any other Greek temples. And uh, Artemis here was, was prized for the goddess of childbirth and the great mother goddess of all things living. So you see this, this uh, multi-breasted depiction with animal carvings all over it is meant to show that she's considered the midwife and uh, to all births, both human and animals alike. You see that this, the columns on this temple, there's 127 columns that hold up a roof that's 60 feet high. So again, this was a massive temple. This was a big thing. It was considered at the time to be one of the seven wonders of the world. And as Josh said last week, much of the industry in the area was related to this temple. Ephesus was also known for its great amphitheater. It was built into the side of a mountain, and it would seat tens of thousands of people. So when we're talking later and we say that they went into the theater, you might think of, you know, maybe a theater production at the school or a, a local theater you've been in. And it's nothing like that. It's actually this giant amphitheater. So just keep that in mind as we're talking about they went into the theater. Ephesus had a high cultural value on magic. The city was proud of its religious idol worship. And as we saw last week, most of Paul's time spent there was spent first in the, the synagogue and then... He went on for two years, reasoning in the house of Tyrannus. It says, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And today we're going to talk about healing rags, botched exorcisms, and confused riots. But it's more than that, really, because what we're doing is we're looking back at the early stages of the church in Ephesus. So we really get to, to peek back and see what was happening in their lives as Paul worked with this early church. And through this all, we're going to see that God's word increased and prevailed. So we start out in verse 11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Does anyone else think this is, this is just weird, right? We start out, starting out, this is kind of weird. Uh, it makes me think of those ministries maybe you've seen where, that are offering anointed prayer cloths. Uh, maybe you've seen that on, on TV or you've gotten one in the mail. A quick internet search online, I found an example. It said, after much demand, we've decided to once again offer a prayer cloth to each person who contributes $10 or more. You can find them online. They could be as much as $100, even more. Uh, is what's going on here the same thing that's going on on TV and online and these, these things that you get in the mail today? I'm going to say that they're not. They're not alike. And we're just going to go into this passage and kind of keep that, keep that in mind as we contrast uh, what happens there versus what was really happening. Because a lot of, a lot of people will use this, this passage to kind of... Um, say this is why we do that. So let's look at what's really going on in this passage. First of all, these, these handkerchiefs and aprons were actually Paul's sweat rags and his dirty aprons that he would wear as he worked in the, in the tent making shop. So we know he worked as a tent maker. And, and what we see here is it seems that Paul is passive in this. So Paul would work in the, the tent making shop during the day 
uh, it doesn't say that he would close up shop. He would go out and he would uh, set up a table and maybe he'd sell pieces of cloth and sell pieces of his, his aprons and his uh, sweat rags. No, it says that they were carried away. So I imagine the scenario would be something closer to there's, there's someone with a sick relative or a sick friend and they've heard about Jesus and they've heard about Paul and the healing that he does and they, they want to get to Paul and they go and look for him and the closest they can get is to find one of his sweat rags or one of his aprons that are left at where he's been working. And so they carried these away and they took them to the sick and God allowed these people to be healed. So one thing I want to, it starts right out, and it says that God was doing uh, extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So no, these miracles are not done by Paul. These miracles are not done by the items that are carried away. It's God behind this. And, and a miracle is power. It's the power of God. When we ask God for a miracle in our lives, we ask for healing. We ask for God's supernatural power to, to do that work. And it's no different here. God was doing it through Paul but Paul seems to be passive in it, maybe even unaware that this is going on at the time. And Luke has been with Jesus, and Luke has seen a lot of things, and yet he calls these extraordinary miracles. And a miracle, by definition, is extraordinary. It's an extraordinary or improbable event. So really what he's saying is this was, this was a miracle, but not an ordinary one. So if you can imagine, there's ordinary miracles, and then there's extraordinary miracles. The only thing we see slightly similar to this is a story that Mark tells about the life of Jesus, and he describes for us when there was a woman who was sick for, for quite some time, and she wanted to get to Jesus for healing, and she pushed her way through the crowd, and she reached out, and she was able to touch Jesus' garment, and as soon as she touched him, she was healed. And Jesus looked around, and when he found this woman, he said, your faith has made you well. So what's happening here is really this is someone's desperate faith to get to God, and God is honoring that, and he's providing this healing. Paul isn't soliciting donations at any point. As I said, he's not setting up a prayer cloth sale. And when we see these miracles, we see that they're just a miracle that was, that was similar done by Jesus, and one by one of the great apostles, which was Paul. So I don't think to try to copy this or try to copy the fabric in here uh, would be the right thing to do. If we're going to copy anything, I would say we should be copying the desperate faith of the people who said if they could just get to Jesus or if they could just get to this Paul who Jesus proclaimed, then they knew that they could be healed. But ultimately, this was all done for God's glory. Anytime that Paul would, would do a miracle or do healing, it would be accompanied by the gospel. Anytime a miracle goes out, uh, what good would it do to heal someone and then have them lose their soul? So to do a miracle just for the sake of uh, um, to make money off of it or to get fame would, would not be accomplishing what God wants to accomplish. So all this is done to display God's power for his glory and for the salvation of many. And God honored the faith of these people, even the little faith to come out. And, and if anything, we should copy that and not the rags. Because we worship God, we don't worship materials. And we all know today that, that we don't need a piece of cloth, we don't need a piece of material to get to God because of what Jesus has done for us. We have access to him all the time. Don't get me wrong, our God, God is all-powerful, and he could use any means that he wants to to spread the gospel. So we can't limit God's power. Clearly, he does operate in strange and miraculous ways. He's still greater today than any sickness or any suffering or evil spirits. So pray for miracles. Ask God for great things. If you have a sick or suffering friend, I would encourage you to pray. If you're sick... James tells us to call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So we have some guidance for this. It says, In the prayer of the faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. 
Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So again, this is just some, some guidance that we have from the book of James. And, and what's happening here is when you're, when you're going to the elders of the church and asking them to pray, it's just a way of humbling yourself before God and, and asking for his help. So if things couldn't get any stranger today, there were some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists who undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Siva were doing this. So Ephesus had a high cultural value on magic. And you had these traveling Jewish exorcists going around. And John Paul Hill explains uh, this way. He says, Jewish exorcists were held in high esteem for the venerability of their religion and the strangeness of their Hebrew incantations. Magicians and charlatans were omnipresent in the culture, offering various cures and blessings by their spells and incantations, all for a financial consideration. The more exotic the incantation, the more effective it was deemed to be. So what these guys were doing was they were, they were tacking the name of Jesus onto their incantation. So when Paul went out and he, he healed someone, he did it knowing that it's the power of Jesus. He did it because of his relationship with Jesus. He did it knowing that Jesus is providing the healing, that Jesus is casting out the demons. When these guys did it, they did it like it was a magic word. It was something they could tack on. And look at what they say. They say, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. So do you think they knew Jesus or they just knew that Paul was talking about Jesus and it was working for Paul? That's what I would call a copycat ministry when someone sees another successful ministry and they just try to copy it. They see Paul, they see he's being successful, they see a lot of people following him and they say, okay, well, we're just going to do the same thing he's doing, say the same things he's saying in hopes that we're going to get popularity, success, or wealth. And that's not how we're supposed to do ministry we're not supposed to copy someone else or do what someone else is doing. The Holy Spirit should be leading us in the hearts and minds. He doesn't lead us to copy someone else. So the way they were trying to get popularity, success, or wealth, this reminds me of just a few weeks ago in Acts 8, Simon the sorcerer was trying to buy himself the power of the apostles, and this is similar. He say, said, give me the power also that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Do you remember that? But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for the heart is not right before God. So what we seem to see in each one of these examples is that oftentimes false teachers and people that try to use these things for their own good are actually doing it usually for money. So maybe what they're worshiping is the money and not God. We see here the seven sons of Siva were doing this. And this evil spirit answers them. And it says, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt on them, mastered all of them, overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon all of them, and the name of the Lord was extolled. So some people say this is a comical passage. These guys go in there, they get beat up, they get thrown out. But I would argue that this is terrifying. Imagine if this was in your neighborhood. It says, all the residents of Ephesus, this became known to them. Imagine if this was in your neighborhood and you heard that this, someone went in to exercise a demon and the evil spirit spoke to them, right? And, and what, we're, what we're to understand here is that they encountered a real powerful demon because these seven men were overtaken by this one man who was overcome by this evil spirit. This man was super, supernaturally strong and he drives them all out and fear fell upon all the neighborhood, all of the residents. And then it says that the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled.
So the word extol means to glorify. So how is it that when these men are overrun by an evil spirit, that Jesus is extolled, Jesus is glorified? We see that God can use even the evil spirits for his glory. And it also shows the people that the God of Paul is not to be manipulated like the other gods of the ancient world. We continue in verse 18. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So what stands out here is it doesn't say the pagans came and started divulging their practices. These were believers. It said these believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And, and what they're doing is they're trusting in God and something else. They have God and. Maybe they have God and their magic practices. They have God and their idols or the talismans. And they realize that even though they put their faith in Christ, certain things in their life are now incompatible. They see that participation in the magic arts and the occult no longer have a place in their life, so they burn their books. This is a vivid picture of confession and repentance. This is a radical expression of that. Believers are confessing and disclosing their practices, and then they burn their items. It shouldn't surprise us that when someone connects with God through salvation, that then there's a process of growth. So these people connect with God, they accept Christ, they're, they're, they're believers. And as they start to learn, they start to realize, hey, there's some things that don't line up in my life. And maybe they're seeing these things and they're, they're, they're saying, hey, I have some of these practices in my life that, uh, that are pretty scary, that don't line up with God. We know that Isaiah tells us that God says, I am the Lord and there's no other besides me, there's no God. And if you're a believer and you're, you're practicing these other things, you might want to get rid of them. You might want to take that out of your life. That could be pretty scary. And we're told they counted the value, and it was a large sum. 50,000 pieces of silver. So silver has quite a bit of worth today. Could you imagine 50,000 pieces of silver, how much that would have been worth? So the fact that they tell us they counted the value must tell us that it was a sacrifice for them to do this. Not only that, but maybe they were keeping these books because they had great value. Maybe they say, well, I'm a believer now, but this, I spent all this money on this stuff. I'm not going to get rid of it. And as they started to grow, their love for Christ became more important than the financial amount of these books. So they burned the books. They could have given them away. They could have sold them, but they know that's not keeping, you know, what Christ followers are supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be spreading the good news not spreading this poison. It's very interesting as we get to look back at the church in Ephesus that we're in at the ground level right now. We're getting to see this is where they had a new love for Jesus. And this, is very, this is very interesting and very neat to see that this is what it looks like when they had a new love for Jesus. What would it look like if we confessed our dependence on something other than God? Maybe we're depending on our career and God. Maybe it's God and our money. For some, it might be idols and God. Some, it might be the same as this. It may be God and the magic arts. Could be a dependency on your cell phone. Could be taking away from your, your time with God. James 1, 14 through 15 tells us that each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin when it's full grown, gives birth to death. As Christ followers, we must continue to confess our sins and repent of the things we put our trust in. So it's not just a one-time thing in the beginning. It's as we continue to grow, as we continue to see things creep into our lives that don't line up, we must confess and repent of those things that we put our trust in. And after all these things, we see that the word of the Lord continued to increase mightily and prevail mightily. So we see many times in Acts where we get these kind of updates. The, the word of the Lord increased. 
We've seen the word of the Lord uh, increased, the number of disciples increased, and this is the first time we see it prevailed mightily. So the word prevail means to prove more powerful than an opposing force, to be victorious. So we see that the word of God had to prevail over something here. And this should wake us up. This should help us to understand that there are forces out there at any point when the gospel tries to move forward. There are forces out there counter to that. There are opposing forces. There, there are things that want to go against that. And the cleansed church became a powerful and growing church. And the word of God was fought for and won against a power, against a resistance and opposition. And God's hand was evident here in protecting Paul through all these things. So Paul preached the gospel. People got converted. And as they start to grow, they renounce their sin. And God's word increased. We see this as kind of a pattern that's going on here. And as this happened, it started to impact the communities around them. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. So we get this little, this little update here. We see that Paul has set his sights on Rome. And Paul's a missionary at heart. You know, he wants to get to the next place. He's actually been here for quite a while in Ephesus, and he wants to get to the next place. And I know I do this. I, I think I got to do this on Monday. I got to do this on Tuesday. And then by Friday, I'll be able to do the next thing. Um, and I think that's what he's doing here. He's thinking about all the things that he has to do. He has to get to Macedonia. He has to get to Achaia. And he has to get to Jerusalem. And as we see later, in Romans, it's because he's, he's collecting, he's taking up an offering for the saints in Jerusalem. And also he wants to, to visit these churches and he wants to see these people. And we see what he, what he did here. Is, as always, he has some, some disciples with him. And he has Timothy and Erastus, and he sends them on ahead of him. And I just think that this is, uh, must have been quite a blessing to him to think about all the things that he needs to get done and he wants to get to these places, and he, he has these two people who are willing to serve who are able to go ahead of him and prepare the way for him. So Timothy and Erastus as disciples must have been quite a blessing to him, and it shows that he doesn't do it on his own. Nobody's meant to do it on his own. He has help here. But Paul stays in Asia for a while, and about that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. And the way was just a tag that we see in, in Acts that was given to the followers of Jesus. They called him the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And that's true, right? That's what Paul was saying. Paul was teaching them that gods made with hands were not gods, and the power of the gospel was dwindling their business. So angry Demetrius, he continues here, and there's danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all of Asia and the world worship. So Artemis is a big deal here in the city, right? And the trade was lucrative for the silversmith and for the craftsman. You just get this feeling that Demetrius is working the crowd. He's gathering support. He's appealing to their finances first, right? He says, this trade of ours may come into disrepute, right? So he's saying, look at, look at our fourth quarter earnings, they're down. Look at our sales on our trinkets and our, our idols, they're down. Look at our customer count at the temple, it's down, right? He's getting riled up and he's saying, you know, we're going to be out of business. We're not even going to have a job pretty soon. So he's appealing to their greed. And then he goes even further and he says, 
Also, this temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence. So now he's going on to their, their civic pride, and, and he's talking about um, their reputation. You know, all the world knows about this. All the world comes here to worship, and, and, and we're known for this. If you come to Ephesus, we're known for this temple and for this worship, and Paul's going to ruin that. And the sad part here is that Demetrius, because of his greed, doesn't want to hear anything that Paul has to say. Demetrius isn't interested in hearing the gospel. He's not interested in hearing about the lives that are changed or the healing that was done because he's so concerned with his finances. And even that, I, I don't think he even really cares about the temple as much as he cares about that's where he gets his income from. That's how they make their money. And it makes us stop and pause. Is there any pride or greed that's allowed a foothold in our lives that keeps us from hearing what God wants us to do? or hearing about God in our lives. So Demetrius has got these guys worked up. And when they heard this, they were enraged, and they were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, so that the city was in confusion. Right? The whole city starts, it probably starts out, he's on the corner, he's talking about these things, he's, he's got his silversmith guild and the craftsmen, and he's getting them worked up, and then the crowd starts to gather, and it becomes more and more. And now he has the whole city filled with confusion. They rush together into the theater. Remember that theater we talked about earlier? They rush into that theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus. And Gaius and Aristarchus would just be tokens of their anger now. They just grab them. They can't get to Paul, so they get a couple of his friends and they drag him. And when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. So Paul wants to just rush in there and help his friends, right? This is courageous Paul. Or maybe he says, hey, I got a group of, I got all these people together in the, in the theater. Let's go preach to them. I mean, maybe that's why he wanted to get in there. But I think he wanted to get in there to speak up for his friends, to speak on his friends' behalf. And he knows that his God is greater, and he's not afraid of this, and he wants to go in there, and he's faced things like this before. So, so he says, I can get in there and let me speak to these people. But the Christians who are with him, in their wisdom, they stop him. They say, well, there's a bunch of angry, angry people in there. It's a big, angry mob. You don't need to go in there. And then we see even the Asiarchs, which were the rulers in the area, were actually friends of him with, with him, and he must have had a good relationship with them because they sent word to him too and said, don't go in there. Don't be a part of this. So they kept him from going in there. Now the people cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. That's right. Some people say, this is funny, right? So you have this riot. And like all riots, it's a confused mess, just like any riot we would see today. And this reminds me of a story from C.K. Chesterton, which kind of, I would say, sums up like the, the anatomy of a riot. And I want to share that with you. Suppose a great commotion arises in the street about something, let's say a lamppost, which many influential persons desire to pull down. A gray-clad monk is approached and begins to say, let us first of all consider, brethren, the value of light if light itself be good. At this point, he's somewhat excusably knocked down. All the people make a rush for the lamppost, and it's down in 10 minutes. And they all go about congratulating one another on their unmedieval practicality. But as things go on, they do not work out so easily. Some people have pulled down the lamppost because they wanted the electric light. Some because they wanted old iron. Some because they wanted darkness, because their deeds were evil. Some thought it not enough of a light, some too much. Some acted because they wanted to smash municipal machinery, some because they just wanted to smash something. And there was war in the night, no man knowing whom he strikes. So gradually, inevitably, today, tomorrow, or the next day, there comes back the conviction that the monk was right after all. It all depends on what is the philosophy of light. 
Only what we might have discussed under the gas lamp, we now must discuss in the dark. So this theater that seats 25,000 people is filling up. And some of these people are here to protest what they believe to be a great social injustice. Some are there just because of greed. Others just to watch the show. Some are there to loot. And just like any riot, the crowd is worked up, and most of them didn't even know why they were there. So some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward. And Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the Jews probably prompted Alexander to speak they, 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 because they wanted to distance themselves from the Christians. They probably wanted to say, listen, we're, we're the Jewish people. We're not the Christians. Uh, we practice Judaism. We have nothing to do with these people. And, and they probably wanted to say, we, we're not hurting your idol sales. We're not hurting your temple. We don't have anything to do with this. But all this did was add to the confusion. And they start shouting, and they continue to shout for two hours. Could you imagine? For two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. This whole mob for two hours. And finally, the town clerk is able to get them quieted down. And he says, men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and a sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are pro -counsels. Let them bring charges against one another, but if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there's no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So what an unlikely end of the story. God uses a pagan town clerk who gets the people's attention, and he asserts the innocence of both of Gaius and Aristarchus, and therefore also exonerates Paul in the process. He says to him, you know what he said to him? He said, don't take these problems into your own hands. You take them to court. Right? You think that's what he said? He said, he told him the process to go through, to, to, to do this with proper channels, he quieted him down, and he dismissed him. So by God's sovereign grace, he used his town clerk to end the riot. And the story shows us a number of things. One, which I hope I don't have to really go into too much explanation, but as Christians, we should not be taking part in riots. There's no wisdom in that. I think that should go without saying. But also it shows us how we advance the kingdom of God. It's not by violence or by force. Paul preached the gospel, people got converted. And through this, they renounced their sin, and the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the whole social order was impacted. So one at a time, people came to Christ, and as they came to Christ, they naturally turned away from these things. So you don't see Paul down there picketing, picketing the temple and saying, tear down the temple, tear down the temple. He's just out day after day. They actually say when he was reasoning in the house of, house of Tyrannus, it wasn't a 40-minute message. It was sometimes he could go for hours and hours and then into the night. So he, he was doing this day after day on top of his normal job. And as people were coming to Christ, it was changing the world. It was changing the community. Don't underestimate the power of the gospel. God might even use a group of believers here at FBC Afton. Do you believe that? Are you willing to follow Christ? We have a common mission to be ambassadors to the area around us. We need to exalt Christ in our town. If you ever make it to Ephesus today, you'll see that the Temple of Artemis is gone. The statue of Artemis, it's in a museum. Demetrius is gone. Silversmith Guild, gone. Even the town is no longer there. 
Ephesus, the city of Ephesus is no longer there. It's an archaeological site now. However, what we do have remaining is four letters to the Ephesians. Three are from Paul. We know it as the book of Ephesians, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And then the fourth one is from Jesus to the church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. And I'm going to close with that. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. Straight A so far. All these things are just praises for the church of Ephesus. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works that you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So he even tells him what to do here. He says, repent and do the works you did at first. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So when I said it was interesting earlier that we just read about this great period in the Ephesian church. When they came to the Lord, they made God a priority. They turned from their sin. And here, just 40 years later, Jesus says to them, you abandoned your first love. He doesn't say you lost your first love. He says you abandoned it. Perhaps it was slowly, maybe bit by bit. Maybe a few things here and there. Could be like that for us. We could leave our priorities slowly, get distracted slowly to where we leave our first love. There's also no longer a Christian church in Ephesus the city of Ephesus was located in what is modern-day Turkey, which is predominantly a Muslim country. The church of Ephesus used to be the strongest church in Asia Minor, and now there's hardly even any Christians to be found in all of Asia Minor, let alone any church of any size or, or strength. So I want you to think about that contrast between the church that was powerful, growing, and impacting the city around them, and the one that abandoned its first love. And what are we to love? They, they love Jesus, right? And Jesus said that, Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And then unprompted, he added, the second commandment is like that, to love your neighbor as yourself. So I would say that if you want to impact your community, if you want to impact your neighbors, you have to love them. And you can't love them if you don't love the Lord your God. And we have to be careful of these things that come into our life that, that take away from that. And the only way to, to be on top of that is to continue to grow, to continue to confess these things and turn away from the things that take our affections away from Christ. So which one do you want to be? Do you want to be the church that was powerful, growing, and impacting the city, or the one that abandoned its first love? We have to love the Lord Jesus with all sincerity. Let's pray. Father God, as we just read, you are a great God, capable of far more than we can imagine.